Good afternoon. House Education Finance Committee will come to order. Well, let's see, we've got a lot of bills on the agenda, so I think we'll get right to it. Uh, Representative Erickson, have you had a chance to review the minutes uh, from the March 7th meeting? Madam Chair, I move approval. All right. Uh, any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes from March 7th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Minutes are approved. Thank you, Representative Erickson. All right. Uh, first up, we have uh, Speaker Doubt, Representative Doubt, present House File 1428. Welcome, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, this is my first bill hearing in four years, so uh, I did bring treats for the committee. Where are the treats? Which, Somewhere. Which bodes very well. Oh, here they well. are. Bodes very well for around. you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Thank hopefully. You. This All right, is, so uh, I, uh, I will move your bill just to have it officially before the committee. Um, I would move that House File 1428 uh, be held over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill or further action at a later time. Thank you, Madam Chair. To your bill. Um, House File 1428 is a highly controversial bill uh, that I have battled uh, with the Department of Education for <laughs> months uh, to come to, I think, it, what is an agreement. I'm teasing, by the way. Um, there, was a, there was a change made in statute. Uh, so I have a residential treatment facility in my district that educates their uh, kids off-site. Um, and uh, the, the uh, school district is reimbursed um, a special education uh, amount for those children uh, and and there was a change made in statute for kids that are educated on site uh, a couple of years ago I think it was in 2012 um, that change inadvertently uh, eliminated the ability for my school district to be reimbursed for educating their kids off-site and it was actually a couple of years before anybody realized that this even had happened um, I have talked to the Commissioner of Education and, and uh, we came up with some language to fix this it was basically an oversight um, at the time and and uh, uh, the school district, there is no fiscal cost. There is a fiscal note. There is no fiscal cost. Uh, the school district uh, has not, um, they have been reimbursed by the Department of Education uh, since this happened, but we just want to correct the language and statute to make sure that there's no problem in the future. And I would stand for questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, uh, members, there is a, the, the fiscal note that the speaker reference is in your packets and does indicate a zero uh, fiscal note cost on it. Um, any questions for Representative um, <laughs> Thank <you Madam> Chair. <laughs> Scott? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just wondering if you have any more bills like this that have zero fiscal notes that you could bring to our committee. <laughs> Representative Doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Representative Krisha. Madam Chair, where is this bill headed? Uh, it's going to stay in the possession of this committee for the meantime. No, no chance it could go to civil law. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Uh, other other questions? All right. And you have no other testifiers, is that correct? I do not. Uh, my school district was not able to be here today. Uh, they certainly appreciate your support on the bill and the issue. It, it's important to them. I think if they did lose this funding, it would be about an $800,000 difference uh, for them per year. And, and so that is significant. Um, this bill only deals with uh, the residential treatment facility in my district. Um, if we do find out that this impacts other uh, districts as well that have similar facilities we can certainly probably make that change in the future but um, this one deals specifically with my district so uh, they're not here I don't know if somebody from the Department of Education is here and I'm certain they would be willing to uh, testify in favor of the speaker's bill <laughs> um, oh. yes we have someone from the department here <laughs> welcome and please just stay your name for the record uh, my name is Caitlin Elizabeth Snyder. I am the Deputy Director of Government Relations at the Department of Education. And I would um, echo what the speaker said. This was not an intentional change to the uh, special education formula. So um, this language um, should has the potential to move forward. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Very well. Well, um, if there are no other questions, I think we're good. Any any closing comments, Mr. Speaker? No, that's it. I appreciate your uh, your giving it a hearing and and uh, your giving the the issue some time. It's important to my district, so thank you very much. All right, thank you, and we gratefully appreciate the treats. And uh, with that, I would renew my motion that House File 1428 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right, um, Representative Davids. Thank you. 
All right, welcome, Mr. Chair. And I will go ahead and move your bill to get it before us. And there is an author's amendment as well, I understand, and another amendment. So um, I would move that House File 786 be re referred to the Committee on Taxes. I believe is the motion today. And um, would you like uh, for me to go ahead and add the DE1 amendment? Please, Madam. All right, sure. so, and I would also move the DE1 amendment to get the bill in the shape that the author would like. Any questions? All right, seeing none, uh, all in favor of the DE1 amendment to House File 786, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and your amendment has been added. Uh, Mr. Chair, to your bill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And for the record, I'm going to be very clear that on House File 1428, myself and the full tax committee are in complete support <laughs> of <laughs> that bill. Okay, as far as uh, 786 is amended, I'm very fortunate to have with me uh, two superintendents of schools, one from District uh, 28B, Superintendent Ben Barton. Uh, this bill has to do with school district maximum effort, uh, capital loans, property tax reductions, and members. This bill was in uh, the conference report for House File 848 last year, uh, and as you know, that was uh, pocket vetoed. Uh, and so we're coming back, circling the wagons back to try and uh, uh, finish uh, this uh, situation up here. So I'd like to introduce Superintendent Ben Barton, who has some comments, and then we'll stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Barton. Uh, thank you, Chair Loon. It is a pleasure to be here. My name's Ben Barton. I'm Superintendent of Schools uh, for the Caledonia Area Public Schools District, and that's in southeastern Minnesota, where uh, Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin all come together. Uh, to give you some perspective there. Uh, as Representative uh, Davids had pointed out, uh, this uh, bill that's before you mirrors a bill that was in the tax uh, bill that had 89% bipartisan support. Unfortunately, it did not go through, but here we are again, we're, and uh, we're here on behalf of our uh, taxpayers in our uh, area. This uh, does not uh, only help the Caledonia Area Public School District. There are other districts uh, that will benefit as well, and that's where Superintendent almost can testify to that as well. But uh, forgive me, I just want to, I'm going to read to you some prepared remarks um, as it relates to our story to give you a little uh, idea on, on the maximum effort cap alone and how that has impacted our school district. All right, so I'll start. Uh, Caledonia School built a new middle school and retrofit an elementary school in 2001. A portion of the project was funded with a local bond and the remaining approximate 14.1 million was funded by a maximum effort capital loan by the state. Although I'm not an expert in capital loans, I understand that it is, fairly, uh, it, it is a fairly rare funding mechanism and only a small percentage of school districts in the state have qualified for such funding. I also understand that the original intent was to assist in addressing failing facilities in districts with lower property values that could not pass local bond referendums. The terms of the loan requires taxpayers to be taxed at the maximum effort. This is the rate of 29.39% of adjusted net tax capacity uh, in their district. There was a law in 2011 uh, that gave some school districts with outstanding maximum loan effort capital loans the opportunity to pay off their loans by paying only the original principal amount of the loan and essentially forgiving all uh, interest accumulated on the loan since its inception. However, the law was restricted to loans that were authorized prior to January 1997, and Caledonia was not part of that. Uh, most of the districts that benefited from the 2011 law had paid little or no principal or original, uh, no principal or interest on the loan that had accumulated signi uh, significant additional interest that added to the amount owed. This directly related to the low ANTC in most of these communities. Last legislative session passed legislation that allowed districts receiving capital loans after 1997 to receive the same option as those districts included in the 2011 law. 
In addition, most capital loan districts refunded their loan with a local bond and paid back the state this last November. This was due to the elimination of one day bond options and incentive aid that the state offered. This brings us to the language that's presented today. This bill is essentially a bill of fairness and equity. As previously stated, the majority of capital loan communities paid little to nothing on the loan principal and interest. However, a few districts, Caledonia included, paid millions to the state in principal and interest. This was due to the significant increase in our ag assessed land value. Our ANTC went up significantly and therefore our resident taxes went up significantly because the terms of the loans required residents to be taxed at 29% of ANTC. Essentially our ag uh, landowners shoulders the burden of these significant tax increases. As you know, property value doesn't reflect actual dollars that our ag owners have in their bank accounts. This bill provides property tax credits equal to the interest each district paid back to the state. Only districts that paid down their interest to the state would benefit from this bill. We are simply looking for the same benefit as many districts received from the law passed in 2011. Again, we feel that this is about fairness and equity. Uh, I thank you for your time, Chair Loon and, and committee. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. And we just really appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Burton. Um, let's see what we'd like to hear from Mr. Almos next. Hey, Madam Chair and committee, uh, my name is Andy Almos, uh, superintendent of schools in East Central Minnesota. That's by Sandstone and Askover right up the Highway 35 corridor. Um, I, I won't uh, uh, reiterate what Mr. Barton said. Our district is in a similar position. Uh, our capital loan was for $19 million back in 2001. Uh, we paid in roughly $1.5 million back to the state uh, over, the, over the life of the loan. And I think this comes down to two, to two things that, and some, some of which has been talked about, but um, it was the state's desire to sunset the capital loan program. And in the supplemental budget bill uh, last session, um, we appreciated the transition money on, that, that we got on that. But we, but we do think this next piece uh, helps our local taxpayers uh, with, with the tax impact that comes along with sunsetting that program. Um, so it is, it is definitely a tax, a tax issue, and it is a direct, uh, a direct benefit back to the taxpayers in our school district. So um, unless you have questions for me, that's all I have at this time. All right, thank you. Do you have other testifiers, uh, Representative Davids? I do not, Madam All Chair. Right. All right, uh, open it to questions. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Superintendent Barton, I'm just wondering if this wouldn't go through, would you have to cut programs such as your football program so that Eden Valley Watkins, of which I graduated, <laughs> would have a better time to win at state? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, that's, it's great to have great competition, and we, <laughs> we love playing you guys in big football games. Um, we're very proud of our programming down in Caledonia. This actually would not impact our schools. Okay. This, is, this, is, uh, this has really nothing to do with school funding uh, and us having more or less money. It really has to do with our taxpayers in our community and lowering some of their property uh, taxes. So this is just simply trying to fight on the behalf of our uh, community members that pay taxes uh, in our district. Thank you, and and um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask what the mascot name is for Caledonia. I know the chair knows because he knows every school mascot in every state in the state. You don't know? I chair, do not know. Chair Loon? Oh. I'm, I'm uh, we are the Caledonia Warriors. Warriors. The Warriors. Very yes. Good. Very good. Representative Dice. And Madam Chair, I will say, I don't know what they're doing down there, but they are growing some incredible football players. <laughs> if it wasn't for them, I think Eden Valley Watkins would have won. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very you. Much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other questions? All right, seeing none, uh, we do have another amendment to the legislation in your packets. Representative Erickson. Uh, uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the uh, H0786A1 amendment. All right, uh, to your amendment, Representative Erickson. Well, I have the Lions, <clears throat> if you wanna know my team name. Uh, but this is for a school district that has uh, a maximum effort loan that will be forgiven on June 30th, 2021. 
uh, but they are facing, uh, as the superintendent from Caledonia noted, uh, a taxpayer crisis. Uh, this is a low property district, and there may be uh, others that fall into this category as well. Uh, but this is one that uh, I am requesting that they join hands with Representative David's uh, proposal here, at least for the time being, until perhaps we can work out some other uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, so with that said, Madam Chair, I will not name the school district, just that they're the Lions, uh, and that they're, uh, they uh, have an outstanding loan as of June 30th of this year that will be forgiven on June 30th, 2021. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Erickson. Um, <clears throat> any questions or uh, Representative Davids to the er Erickson Amendment? Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and to Chair Erickson's Amendment. I would consider that friendly at this point. I think we need to go over and see the tax impact uh, over the tax committee, uh, if that would be, if the education would be willing to do that. And I, I think for the record, too, I don't think House File 786, even as it is amended and will be amended, costs anything for this committee no. it, is that correct uh, I believe so but I'll um, um, confer to mr. Strom if he wishes to confer that or miss Adrian madam chair the text chair is correct right, so. I don't think I'd be sitting here if it was any different madam chair. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, representative Sandstein. thank you madam chair I guess I was wondering what school district we're really talking about. <laughs> and then you mentioned you weren't going to name it. So. Can I say? <coughs> Madam Chair? I believe. Representative it's, Davidson. It's Ogilvy. Ogilvy, home of the Mighty Lions. Mighty Lions. Yes. Mighty Lions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Madam Chair, we don't name, you know, in statute uh, necessarily, uh, you know, a specific school district. That's why it's generic. Correct. <coughs> uh, other Sorry. questions? That's all right. <laughs> Other questions? All right, seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and vote on the Erickson Amendment, the A1 Amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the A1 Amendment has been added uh, to House File 786. Any other questions on the bill? To Representative Davids. All right, seeing none, final comments, Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate the hearing. I really appreciate your support on the bill as amended. All right, very good. And uh, with that, I'll renew my motion that House File 786 as amended be re referred to the Committee on Taxes. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the bill is on its way to your committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Representative Anderson, if you want to come on down. <clears throat> All right, welcome, Representative Anderson. Nice to have you back with us today. Well, it certainly is. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, and I will go ahead and move uh, House File 485. Uh, so it's formally before us, and it's my understanding that you do have an author's amendment for it as well. Yes, it is the um, A1 amendment, Madam Chair. All right, very good. So uh, I will move that House File 485 uh, be um, held over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill or further action at a later time. And, uh, and then I will also move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like. Uh, any questions on the A1 amendment? And I'll have you explain the bill as it's amended after we do this. Uh, seeing none, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, A1 amendment is added. Representative Anderson, to House File 485 as amended. Thanks, Madam Chair. My high school was in Starbucks box. No <laughs> anyway. All right, good. Anyway. Um, this bill, uh, if you'd see fit to approve it, is a continuation of, of a bill that uh, you passed last year that got uh, some funding. It continues a, a program I think is really important, uh, helping provide summer contracts for ag teachers and FFA instructors. And the funding we got last year, uh, folks can talk about it, but uh, 43 ag teachers got the extended summer contract. And it's a one-to-one -one match uh, with state money and local school district money. So we've tried to stretch the program out further 
and it had a, had a good big impact last year. Again, 43 schools took advantage of it, and um, back again this year trying to uh, get a little bit more and expand the program because the demand is there for uh, additional summer hours for our ag teachers. And with that, I'll call on the testifiers, Madam Chair, to explain a little bit more fully. Very good. Welcome to all of you. And uh, if you would each just state your name uh, before you begin your testimony. Tom Apple, uh, Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Agricultural Educators. Eric Swatsky, Dasco Cato High School Ag Instructor. And I'm Larry Marquette, a high school instructor at Dasco Cato as well. Right. Great to have you all with us. <clears throat> Whoever would like to lead off, please please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll do the kind of the overview of it, and then uh, we brought a couple actual teachers that can discuss their the impact of what's happened with this uh, program for this last year. <clears throat> As I've indicated, Tom Apple, uh, the executive director of the Minnesota Association of Agriculture Educators. Uh, I rep a group, represent a group of about 245 agriculture teachers at the university, the post-secondary, the farm business management, and the high school level. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be uh, kind of focusing on the high school portion. We have approximately 254 high school agriculture teachers in the state of Minnesota that service about 21,000 students per year. Uh, so that's the group we're going to focus on. Uh, as we look at a complete quality agriculture education program, there's three or four components to that. Obviously, one of those is the nine-month school year. We do all of our, our regular classroom instruction. Uh, we often operate underneath the three-circle model, so we include the FFA as an organization. We also include supervised agriculture experience, where a lot of our students will have crops projects, livestock projects, placement agribusiness, those types of things. All very important. There's another piece that, that has been sort of being left out in recent years. It's been a trend that's been occurring. Uh, and that's the number of days that our instructors have available to provide opportunities to our students during the summertime. Uh, agriculture is a very, very unique discipline in that we'll teach the nine-month school year. Uh, and in the spring, when all the agricultural crops and all the livestock and agriculture itself really comes to life, uh, we seem not to find enough time to go ahead and provide an opportunity for our students to have those quality experiences. Uh, and that's what these two gentlemen will, will address here shortly. Uh, Historically, if you go back, and I'm going to go back a decade or two, uh, it was very, very common for our schools in Minnesota to offer a 40 or a 60 day contract. So those months of June, July, and August, it was very, very common for those instructors to have time to work with students. Uh, that has been a trend that's been going backwards for us. Uh, we've been concerned about it for a number of years, obviously due to finances. Uh, in 2015, we went ahead and did a survey uh, we actually did it at our summer conference so we can make sure we could get a good response. So we had 154 instructors in the state respond to that, uh, which we thought was very, very good. Uh, there's two pieces of information, there's sort of two trends that really stuck out for us and were a concern. Uh, we had 37 schools that don't, didn't offer any extended time. So if there were any students in those programs, they would have no opportunity to go ahead and participate uh, in the extended contract summer type activities. The other one that was a concern, and we broke it down by five day increments, so I'm going to focus on, because of a natural break there, on the 26 days or more, so 26 days to 40 days of instruction provided. Uh, we only had 18 instructors uh, that actually had 26 days or more. The second question we asked in that survey was how many spent time with those at least 26 days. Uh, we only had 18 that were offer days, we had 77 instructors that actually put time in. And then the third component, the third question to that uh, was where do you think it should be? We sort of asked them their professional opinion. Uh, we had 94 instructors that thought that that 26 or more would be the perfect sort of a, an opportunity. So it's been a critical need. It's, it's been a trend that's been going the wrong direction. Uh, we're really talking about opportunities for students here uh, to experience a full program within agriculture education. Uh, and we think it's rather important. So with that, we'll turn it over to these gentlemen right here, and they'll give you a little more idea of what kind of things we're talking about. All right, thank you, Mr. Apple. Again, my name is Eric Swatsky. I teach high school agriculture at Dasco Cato High School. I've been there now seven years. Uh, our program went through a dramatic growth about 16 <coughs> years ago, <clears throat> a rejuvenation of ag education, and they offered a 22 and a half day contract for the teacher that started there uh, back around 2000, 2001. And uh, since then, that one 
individual ag teacher has been there with a 22 and a half day contract. I'm gonna talk through what that contract has allowed us to provide for services for our students. Uh, but then we're gonna follow that with, uh, we fill out the grant after this first go around after the bill was passed last year. Uh, and we were able to provide a second contract of 22 and a half days uh, where my colleague Larry Marquette was able to, is going to be able to add in additional supports this coming summer. So we'll talk about those afterwards. So our school district, if you don't know, is about an hour west of here. We have about 150 students in a graduating class. Um, and uh, we serve about 300 students through the Ag Education Department. So uh, in terms of rural schools, we provide a lot of services in the Ag Ed Department that a lot of students that are involved in agriculture will end up in careers in agriculture. Uh, what I have for a summer contract allows uh, myself to provide services that our community would consider to be the skeletal basic needs of an Ag Ed program. Uh, we knew that there were other needs that were out there, but that contract allowed us to only serve so many students for so many activities. So I'll just list through, through those and then you'll be able to see the, some of the things we're able to hit um, now that we can double the amount of time to provide for our students. So we split between uh, Meeker and Wright County. So we have two county fairs and I work with our students on their projects if they're showing livestock. We have barnyards for educational exhibits for our, our public as they bring in their kids and, and families. Uh, our students spend the summer working on those and if you come to the Wright County Fair you can see a whole new barn that we developed last summer. It took a good chunk of the, the, the summer to work on a project like that um, and our students take a lot of pride in that. So that was a major part of it. Uh, we've advanced a lot of our farm safety training as you may have read over the last few years there's been a significant um, resurgence in the understanding that we need a lot more farm safety training with so many injuries and deaths in our state and uh, across the nation and so we've actually gotten a lot of great local support from our local uh, farm implement dealers to do some local safety training so we've been doing that uh, we set the stage for our school year for our FFA chapter by going on a three-day retreat with our officer team our FFA student leaders develop an entire program plan they call the program activities during that trip and so we we provide that for them in the summer uh, we partnered with Le Litchfield School District uh, their ag program last summer and provided a um, garden at the Meeker Memorial Hospital where we were raising vegetables there harvesting them on a weekly basis uh, and harvesting them in a, actually a much even safer mode than most of your typical garden vegetables because we were going to serve them to our ill patients at the hospital. So our students got to learn a lot about food safety on the production and the harvesting side during that. Um, numerous community landscaping projects throughout the communities of Dassel, Coquito, and Darwin. Uh, and then we also serve a breakfast on the farm where we bring about 2,000 residents into a farm on Wright County uh, early in June. And so that's our basic outline of what our summer has looked like probably for most of the last 16 years. Uh, most of those same things have been the same with a resurgence of a little bit on the gardening and a little bit on the safety training. But that's what we've been able to provide. And, and I'll be honest, I'll, although it's a 22 and a half day contract, it's more like 35 days of true service that we're providing with the students at that stage. So we knew, our district knew that we needed to provide more. Uh, and we discussed with our administration and our business manager that it wasn't about getting an individual more time, it was getting the students more access. Uh, Mr. Marquette, when, uh, I want to give him the moment here to talk about what he's going to be doing this summer, but he's been working and supporting our ag program for eight years now plus, uh, has been an assistant advisor of FFA, and we knew that it was vital that we had the services, and so we aren't extending or increasing an individual teacher's contract. The contract that I'm under stays exactly the same. This is about providing services for the students, and so that's one of the benefits of this as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Swaska. <laughs> All right, I'm Larry Marquette. I've been a teacher at Dasco Cato for the last nine years. I've been the assistant FFA advisor for eight. And this last year, I got certified to teach agriculture through the portfolio method that was kind of new in the state. And so with that, I started teaching a couple classes this year, food science and horticulture, which is pretty exciting because that's right up my wheelhouse. And I've done a lot of different things with raising livestock and raising produce and selling at farmers markets and selling to CSAs. And so I'm living this agriculture thing all the time, so to teach it's really exciting for me. And it also kind of ties into what I'm excited about for the summer because there's lots of kids that are trying to dabble in some little career exploration. They want to maybe do a little research and, and so kind of bringing my science part of that and the access we have to facilities at school that don't really get fully utilized a lot in the summer. Um, we're hoping to have a few different projects go on, or whether it's a kid that's doing a little bit of research on something that's interesting to them on varieties of, of some sort of fruit or vegetable, or maybe they want to grow something and try selling it, you know, on the corner. We have a little farmer's market there. 
but maybe they don't have a spot at home to do that, or maybe they don't have a family that really gets into that, or some grandma that can support them. So hopefully we can have a couple of those start um, and have kids work on their SAE in the summer. I mean, summer is prime time for agriculture to do anything, whether it's research or growing things or just exploring some little um, clinic or something. So we're really excited just to have this availability to, to have students just kind of dabble in stuff and try things out and have a place to go with that. Um, so that'll do the research part in SAE. Um, we're also throwing the idea of our school having a school garden. Um, the facts teacher and the health teacher are really into this, and so the idea is to meet there. But the one thing we kind of always faltered us was having some sort of person to kind of supply it, because it's great to have it all the time. Um, but it gets really arduous if you're always trying to get volunteers all the time to organize things. So we're hoping to kind of get that off the ground a little bit as well. That's one kind of plan. Uh, we had a drone that was donated through our local businesses in town. And we can use that in the winter. I suppose, decently, to look at <laughs> land patterns a little bit and frost, but it'd be nice to utilize it in the summer more, too. So to have a couple opportunities for kids to come out and have the co-op to come out, and we can fly it around and try to get different patterns recognized and try to get different things pulled out of it. Um, that'll allow that quite a bit. And then plus, like Eric had mentioned, we're expanding our barnyard to not just be animals, but also to be more educational and have more interactive displays between students and the fair goers, which we know is a, a huge need to just have people understand agriculture, especially animal agriculture. And so having more time to work with kids on developing some fun activities and have them practice, you know, talking to the clients or community members is, is kind of a big thing. So uh, those are things that I'm kind of hoping for to get involved in this summer. And it'd be kind of fun to have the opportunity to do it. Thank you, Mr. Marquette. And then did you have one more testifier, Representative Anderson? Welcome. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Whitney Place. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs at the Department of Agriculture. The department would like to lend its support to House File 485. Um, the department and the ag industry has identified the need to train and educate the next generation of ag professionals, and programs like this are a tool to provide hands-on education to feed the agricultural workforce pipeline. Ag is a cornerstone of the Minnesota economy. Um, providing about $90 billion to this state. And part of that is human capital. Um, the agricultural industry supports 340,000 jobs in the state. In 2016, there were 3,389 new ag jobs posted in Minnesota alone. And nationally, about 39% of ag jobs um, are going unfilled on an annual basis. So um, thank you to Representative Anderson for this bill, and we are happy to lend our support. Thank you, Ms. Place. All right, and I, did you have any any additional testifiers, Representative Anderson? All right, very good. Thank you. Great presentation. We appreciate it. Any questions from committee members? <laughs> All right, um, you left them speechless, Representative Anderson. Or sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, we are after lunch, so no no judgment there. No, actually. Um, been excited by um, what the grants have been able to do. I think you've described a really great need and a great utilization of, of not a lot of money to try to do this. So I think it's good. Final comments? Yeah, I think you can, you can see the enthusiasm that the instructors have. So to let them continue that during the summertime with these kids is just uh, invaluable. And I would thank you for hearing us and ask for your support. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And uh, with that, I would renew my motion that House File 485, as amended, be held over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill or action at a later time. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the testifiers. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. All right. And Representative Erdahl is making his way down. So we will next turn to uh, House File 1024 in your packet. Welcome, Representative Erdahl, and uh, I will go ahead and move your bill so it's before us. I would move that House Bill 1024 be held over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill, and uh, 
we are pleased to have you with us. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And before I get going on this, I would just like to compliment the previous testimony because, of course, Dassel Cocado is <laughs> in my district. And, uh, I'm sure it's just a coincidence that their program really kicked off 16 years ago when I was elected, but that had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I'm sure it was just a coincidence. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, Madam Chair, uh, I'll begin with this, and you know, I'm going to just do my introduction from the uh, House Research Bill Summary, so if you got that, you can follow along. Uh, small schools revenue is a component of general education revenue. A school district that serves fewer than 960 pupil units is eligible for small schools revenue. Small schools revenue equals the product of the allowance of $544, the district's adjusted pupil units, and the ratio of 960 less the district's adjusted pupil units to 960. And this also leads into one of my other bills on trying to make our system less complicated in how we fund. Uh, this ratio scales the revenue so that the smallest school districts receive the largest amount of revenue per pupil unit. As the district size approaches 960 pupil units, the revenue phases out. Charter schools do not qualify for small schools revenue. For fiscal year 2018, small schools revenue totals $16 million. So that's what's in the small schools fund now. It goes to Minnesota's 156 smallest school districts, those with a student population under 960. House File 1024 makes three changes to the small schools revenue formula. First, it increases the maximum qualifying size from 960 pupils to 1,500 pupils. Second, the allowance is increased from 544 to $606.70, 10% of the basic revenue formula allowance. Finally, each district's pupil count for this formula is limited to less than 750 pupils. These three changes increase the small schools revenue by about 29 million beginning in fiscal year 2018. So what I have for you today, Madam Chair, uh, is a proposal to increase the funding in small schools, uh, the small schools fund by $29 million. Um, I also have anticipating uh, that you might want to look at other options, a plan B and a plan C. Uh, plan B is about $10 million increase. Uh, plan C, about $7.5 million increase. Um, plan D would be other, and you could come up with whatever you wanted to. <laughs> plan E would be none of the above. That's the one we don't want to do. <laughs> so uh, basically, to sum it up, what I'm saying is I would like us to try to find a way to get more money into the small school fund. Thank you. And have a couple of testifiers. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. And uh, welcome to the testifiers. And uh, if you please, uh, as you start your testimony, just state your name. My name is Kim Bell Castro, Superintendent of Renshaw Public Schools. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Committee, for letting me be here uh, to speak to the small schools revenue issue. Um, Renshaw Public Schools has 343 students in K-12. We also have 40 to 50 students in our early learning program. And what's interesting about the very small schools is how small but really how very large they are right. in need. And it's really complicated uh, when we're a traditionally a one section school but we kind of fall over a little bit into that two section school and so we're constantly in, the, in need of more and more support in so many areas. My example for you is this year since school started we had to split fifth grade and because we had 32 students and some with significant needs so we had to split that group in half and hire another teacher. Well that's a big deal in a small school and that costs a lot of money. Uh, we also had to add um, our first and second grade classes were high enough that we had to add a split class for one and two in addition. So it's not, just not so simple when the funding comes in and easy to put it all together. It's a pretty much a very large puzzle that's constantly changing. And so I just, I'm here to just ask for your support in helping our small schools uh, get through uh, the complexities of being able to be successful. 
Um, as a superintendent of a small school, we have accessed some different funding streams that have been extremely helpful to us. For example, Renshaw is a fourth year QCOMP school. That has been very great for our school and our students are benefiting from it. We've been able to really step up the professional development, a focused professional development for our teachers and I couldn't be more pleased with that. But it's just, there's just never enough. And when we talk about bringing in more money, um, this additional funding that we're looking at would bring in $103,000 to Renshaw. And I think of what could we do with $103,000. We could uh, support two entry level teachers with all their benefits. That would take that up right there. We could buy a school bus, which we're constantly in the need of. Uh, we could um, worry school district. I'm the only administrator in the school district and we have a part-time dean of students that handles, helps me handle the day-to-day -day, uh, behavioral issues. We could fund part of the dean of students um, or an elementary counselor, another area of need that we have. So I just wanted you to hear that even in the small schools, we have great needs. And if you could support really looking into this as it's a significant need for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Belcastro. And before the next testifier, I just tell me a little bit more about your school. I grew up in a very small town in a small school district. My graduating class was 25. Um, and so how is your school organized? Do you have a, a K-8 and then the high school or? Nope, we are a PK-12 school district and we're pretty much organized as a very large family. <laughs> and, and we are. I mean, it sounds kind of funny when I say that, but we are. We do, um, we're in a situation now where we're having an influx of students, which is a really a great problem to have, but we're needing to adjust um, our space because our elementary numbers are higher than our high school. And so right now, we don't have our elementary and high school all separated, but we're trying to get them more separated in more age appropriate spaces. Um, but we still value um, doing some things together for that community feel. So does that help? Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Lee Westrom. I'm the superintendent for the Wadena Deer Creek School District in central Minnesota and uh, north central Minnesota. And we are uh, a district of just over a thousand students. And so under the old version of small schools revenue, we didn't receive anything. And so, uh, you know, I, I speak to you today to uh, ask for your support for for this bill, it would mean an awful lot to uh, Wadena Deer Creek and other districts that are that are just outside of, of where that funding cutoff uh, used to be. Um, we are certainly not a big school; we're a lot bigger, a little bigger than Renshaw, um, but a thousand students. You know, I think for all of you folks here, uh, this you know, many of you come from districts that have, you know, um, schools that have three or four times as many students as we have in our entire district, but uh, um, it's really important for you know, our community and for our school district to be able to offer the same types of programming that uh, kids all across the state get. So for us, what this would mean uh, would be teaching positions really, um, and it would also be an equity issue for us. Um, like I mentioned before, we didn't receive any revenue under the previous, or the current version I should say, and the 172,000 that we would receive would uh, would help us out a lot, considering especially that all of the our neighbors um, that surround Wadena Deer Creek all uh, have all receive um, small schools revenue already, and it's a very competitive environment out there for students, as you all know, with open enrollment, and so um, for us to uh, at least get some revenue from from this. Uh, piece would be big. Uh, we still wouldn't get as much as our smaller neighbors, but it would help It would help a great deal. In the past few years, we have uh, maintained our enrollment. It has been steady, um, but we have been deficit spending, and 
we're deficit spending again this year, not by as much, so we're moving in the right direction. Um, and over the past uh, three and a half years, while I've been superintendent for WDC, uh, we've, we've cut a science teacher, a math teacher, a music teacher, and an elementary position. And so we've been making reductions and trying to uh, get to a balanced budget, but we have uh, not been able to do that. And so I would just end that this would, this would help us tremendously, and I appreciate your support. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Westrom. And uh, if there, do you have any other testifiers, Representative Erdahl? Uh, no, but Madam Chair, I do not. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and open to questions. Questions, Representative Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know if this is a question for the bill author or perhaps Mr. Strom, but I was just wondering how many students were affected by this bill. It might be. I'm going to maybe lob that to Mr. Strom. Do you do you know um, how many or Miss Adrian's Miss? How many um, pupils would then be receiving money in their schools under small schools revenue if with this change was made? Um, Madam Chair and members, I know that for the districts, it would affect it. approximately 60 <coughs> more districts would benefit underneath um, the change. And I don't know that I calculated that by pupil. So let me let me do a quick calculation and get back to you. Okay. Madam Chair, I think she Perhaps did. You have to add them all up. Yes, she's got her she's got her magic calculator with her. So. <laughs> Which is why she's very valuable to this committee. I would <laughs> suggest maybe you go on to another question because this yes. will take her a little time. Yes, uh, very good. So, uh, Representative Marquardt. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. And I know, I know this, this question to any of the testifiers, but I know back in the late 1990s, maybe it was 2000, there was a study done by the Rural Development where they looked at this and they came up with an economy of scales and they actually put the data out there where the smaller the enrollment, the larger costs there were just naturally for buildings and so forth uh, per pupil. And, uh, you know, as, you know, if you've got a community of, or a school district of 20 or 30 a class, that's why the declining enrollment formula was so important too, because you might lose 10% of your students, but you can't just cut 10% of your employees because you might have gone from um, 16 in a class down to 12. You still need that one teacher. And so this makes a lot of sense. And so my only thought is I know there's been some other bills out there this year looking at kind of economy of scales. The Minnesota Rural Education Association has been looking at some. And I don't know how this pairs up exactly with that. And I, I've seen, uh, you know, what they're doing. And it'd be nice to kind of compare and look at that. But I do think we need to recognize an economy of scales for these small uh, districts. So thank you, Representative Virgil. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just going down memory lane a little bit. <laughs> Ms. Belcras Belcastro is um, a longtime acquaintance of mine from when she was a teacher. And uh, I was a guest in her classroom several times when she was teaching at Hermantown. And then okay. she went on to administration and went to uh, Albrook and several other places. And now she's superintendent at Renshaw. But Renshaw was an important place in my first election. It was part of my district at that time. In 14B, I think it was called at that time, and I learned very important political lessons at Renshaw, <laughs> and that was uh, in the days when uh, Senator Anderson from North Branch was it? I was talking about school consolidation, and by the third door, door knocking in Renshaw, I pretty well knew. I had to have an opinion on consolidation, and it better not be for consolidation. <laughs> the second question, I got at each of the first two houses and the third house. How are you going to vote on gun control? 
And I pretty well had the message that you vote no on gun control in Renshaw, too. But over the years, I've watched that school district change and grow and diminish. But Superintendent Bel Castro said it's a growing area right now, growing enrollment. And I suspect that's because of that what she said. It's a QCOMP school. The teachers are getting more training, and they have an excellent leader at their head. Thank you, Representative Murphy. Um, and you know, you bring up a, a, an important and a touchy topic. And again, this is something that hits personally. It happened long after I left, but there was a lot of discussions in my own home district, which is not Minnesota, but about consolidation. So I would just ask about um, our school, the school that I graduated from didn't actually end up consolidating for their school purposes, their, their classroom and learning time, but they did consolidate sports teams and do other things like that. So uh, how, how, how has this situation been for you and in uh, Renville and also, or Renshaw, excuse me, mm -hmm. and um, any discussions in terms of any shared services with surrounding school districts that you can try to maximize what you each get to the benefit of all of your students. Yes, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, the last two years prior to this year, the school district was in very serious consolidation talks with the Carleton School District. I mean very serious consolidation talks. And we really gave it a strong effort and were not able to come to consensus. Um, as Renshaw continues to move forward, uh, we have left our door open. Our door is still open for consolidation if indeed we can have the other partner join us. But one of the things in the consolidation talks that was so significant, and I spoke to, in fact, I was down here speaking to the consolidation topic also, was that both communities needed to gain something when you're talking a consolidation. Renshaw, 343 students, Carleton, 460 students. Small school, rural schools. Um, people tend to not want to give away their town with their school, and that's just how that works. And we were not able to come to terms with that. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, Renshaw has gone as far as been willing to locate an elementary school in Carleton and to have the 612 over in Renshaw. The community is... Um, very conservative and they aren't going to want to close their doors on that school if they don't have to and the updates have been made there we are now getting prepared for an april 18th uh, referendum to expand our school that's what's going on right now so it isn't that we aren't willing and we do some collaboration uh, since i've been in Renshaw. I think I've tried five different times to consolidate the athletics, and we have not been successful with that either. So I've just decided we need to do better in Renshaw and just figure it out and do it alone. And so that's what we're trying to do, but we're certainly willing, willing to work together. And we do in some areas, but Carleton hasn't liked working with Renshaw very much. Thank you, that's a, that's a very uh, upfront answer. I appreciate it. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Erdahl. I do have an answer for uh, Representative Marquardt's question. All right. And then actually, while well, well, uh, uh, Mr. Walsh is coming up, I think Ms. Adrian's has a, our number of students affected Representative Peterson's question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members for your patience. Um, it, the, the new districts that would be benefited, it would be about 66,000 students. And the total students um, that would be included in the with the new bill would be about 144,000. Thank you, Mr. Walseth. Thank you, Madam Chair, Member Sam Walseth, uh, Director of Legislative uh, Work for the Minnesota Rural Education Association. And this bill is really a, a, a long time effort. It goes back for uh, many years. Uh, I think Representative Marquardt probably had a bill on this. I don't know, 16 or 17 years ago. Then Representative Eakin tried to model, then uh, Representative Fabian was the one who actually got something through in 2011. 
Um, the Erdahl bill is you know, a product of a lot of work that MRA did with its small schools cohort over the, the summer and fall. It kind of started as a project from uh, some folks in the other body who wanted to take another look at this. Um, to represent Marquardt's question, you could, you know, it's a price tag issue. We're trying to find, we know that a $29 million increase per year is, is a very significant ask of this committee. But at the same time, trying to get some meaningful revenue to each district in the terms of, you know, what $100,000 could do for Renshaw and $172,000 could do for Wadena Deer Creek, you do need that type of price tag. And I haven't had a chance to look at, you know, options B and C and, and further down. Um, to what Representative Marquardt was asking about, you know, the other model that I think the Center for Rural Policy and Development had said is you could just front load, essentially what this bill is doing is front loading the first 750 kids in the door of school districts that have 1,500 or fewer students. You could just take the whole cap off of the 1,500 kids and just say the first 750 kids in the door of every single school district generate additional revenue. So you could extend this all the way from uh, Moorhead to Minneapolis and beyond. Um, but of course that just brings up your price tag up even higher. Um, but so that would be an alternative model to do, uh, to look at. But again, it, it doesn't necessarily help Madam Chair with her uh, budget target. Uh, so this is kind of an attempt to try and find a, a sweet spot, if you will, that would drive some meaningful revenue to those 144,000 students and not have a, a price tag that would you know, not even get us to, to first base uh, in having a conversation. So it's, we're, you know, we're trying to try and find a spot that might be workable for, for the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walseth. And just uh, raising a question in my mind, and probably not a right or wrong answer, but just uh, when we, we talk about small schools, and obviously we have a, a certain standard in the law now, and, and Representative Erdahl's bill would propose to change that. Is there a commonly understood definition of, of small school by per pupil basis? And and um, because I guess some of it is some of it's a, a subjective measure of, of what that would be. And do any other states do something like this? And how would they compare? Um, Madam Chair, I'm not um, familiar with uh, other states and what they might or might not do. Um, what we see typically in some of the education finance literature is when you start to get below a thousand students. Uh, that's where you really start to lose economy of scale and lose efficiencies. Uh, maybe at that 1,500 points or 1,000, but that's where you're still mandated by state law to offer everything that a large school ha must offer, but you just really start running out of the, uh, the economy of scales are not working for you at that point. And so that's why the um, effort here to set the, a minimum amount of revenue for the first 750 kids is really imp uh, important uh, evolution of the current small schools revenue formula, which is a parabola. I had to make sure you got the word parabola on the record today where um, as you go down to zero kids, your revenue is falling off and you at 500 students, you're hitting that sweet spot. And then as you fall down to 960, you fall off the formula. What this would do is raise a minimum amount of revenue for the first 750 kids and, and then it starts to taper off. Thank you. Other questions? All right, seeing none. Oh, Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to address the athletics, I know um, before I had said I'd graduated from Ian Valley Watkins High School, and I know that they've actually combined with Kimball, where if you travel down Highway 55, you've got Kimball. Five miles l later, it's Watkins, and then seven, it's Eden Valley. And they've actually, uh, I think, joined like their track and field and, ah, uh, is it golf program? Something like that. But you know, it's it's really different. The schools have changed a lot. When I graduated in a long time ago, <laughs> 1978, my class was one of the largest at 120. And now I think the classes are like 67, 70 students. So it's been quite a difference. And uh, of course, I'm one of the, I'm towards the end of the baby boomers, but you know, it's really been a difference in um, a lot of things in how the school is run. I hardly recognize it anymore. But uh, it's nice to see at least the communities are coming together to find a way to keep the schools. Because uh, in small communities, the schools are everything. Everything happens at the school. I don't care what it is. Everything happens at the school. Um, schools are the center of many communities. But when you get the small community, that is the center of, this, of the whole deal. So um, I'm really pleased to see this. I think we really need to pay special attention. Thank you. Right. Madam Chair. If I could just comment that uh, Eden Valley and Watkins are beneficiaries under plans A, B, and C. Very good. Very good. All right. Any final comments, Representative Perdall? 
Uh, no, thank you very much. I just appreciate the opportunity to present this today and hope that uh, you will agree that we need to do something more for our, our small schools. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Rudall. And uh, with that, I'll renew my motion that House File uh, 1024 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill or action at a later time. Thank you very much to our testifiers. We appreciate you being with us today. And with that, let's go. Uh, Representative Grossel, I know you have a bill to present in another committee as well. So why don't we get you up and taken care of and hopefully they will not simultaneously come up to grab you as usually timing would have it here. All right, so uh, welcome, Representative Grossel. Um, I will move that House file. Madam Chair, I, I'll move it. Oh, all right, thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll move uh, 1220 for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. I'm the one who initiated this. So uh, <laughs> Representative Grossel represents the far southern part of this district. But I vacation in that area, and uh, this concern came to my attention. So I got the ball rolling. Uh, with Mr. Strom and uh, pulled in Representative Grossel and Representative Green uh, who share this district. It's, it's kind of an anomaly in this part of Minnesota to have a school district that half of its students open enroll, the other half live in the district. And I know Mr. Strom will address those issues. Thank you, Representative Harrison. We appreciate you uh, highlighting that. And uh, Representative Grossel. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Uh, House file uh, 12. 20 will uh, this bill will allow the Neva school district at the discretion of its school board to spread the remaining levy adjustment over three years uh, this will this will help the taxpayers in this area thank you mr. Grossel and I think we'll go ahead and call on mr. Strom just to do a, a walkthrough of the bill for us uh, madam chair members uh, uh, as those of you were here at the time recall and uh, 2013 and 2014, there were some significant changes to the uh, operating referendum program. And prior to that time, one component of the operating referendum was for those school districts that had a very large number of open enrollment students. And Nevis was one of the districts, uh, St. Anthony was another that fit that criteria. And those districts had a different calculation for aid because of all the open enrollment students coming into the district. In 2015, fiscal year 2015, the referendum amounts were converted from the resident pupil, that is from the, in the Nevis case, the 320 some students who lived in the district uh, to the 600 or so students that are served by the district. And that conversion uh, uh, also was intended to keep the aid unchanged for the districts. And with a large, large number of open enrollees, uh, Nevis's aid amount was very sensitive to how the pupil counts were reported. Uh, uh, there was a mistake in the pupil count, and at the time that the aid and levy share for fiscal year 15 was computed, uh, the wrong pupil count was used, and the district was given a larger amount of aid and a smaller levy than otherwise needed. The aid has been recaptured already by the state, so there's no aid cost to this bill. Uh, but the levy adjustment, there's no authority right now for the district to spread that remaining levy adjustment over the next couple of years. So this bill gives the district at the board's discretion the ability to, to uh, instead of having that levy all pile up in one more year, have that levy spread over a couple of years uh, to make that adjustment so that the amount of uh, uh, aid and levy is balanced. Um, so the net result of this bill is no change in state aid and statewide a very small reduction in the levy um, in, the, in the next year and then a small increase in the next two years after that. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Uh, any questions? All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Grossel and Representative Erickson for bringing this forward. Every once in a while we get a situation with a school district that has sort of a a glitch in the system, either because of a change in the law or something that happened, such as a, a mistake in the per pupil uh, number calculation. So we make adjustments. So um, I appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, anything that you would care to add, Representative Brossel? No, Madam Chair, but thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Anything for you? I, I renew my motion that we uh, uh, lay over House File 1220 for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. All right. 
And uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Representative Erickson, and thank you, Representative Grassel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair, was Representative Grassel here before? <laughs> I'm going to throw him under the bus. Uh, I was trying to sneak you out as quickly as I could. I was, I was told that the first bill that you present in a committee, I guess I didn't understand it was every committee. You know, clearly, clearly a memo needs to go out because there's been some confusion about this. And it is first bill at each committee is how many of us interpret that. But right. I, I will offer up that I think there's a few extra cookies from the speaker. And if you want to claim <laughs> credit to them, I won't tell him. So. <laughs> Madam Chair. Representative Daphne. In my understanding, uh, Representative Tice to have made a motion to reconsider. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I heard that part. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to remember that for next time. Okay. I know I'm going to go downstairs now and get the same thing. Yes, <laughs> Thank you, Representative Grossel. It's my hearing, sorry. <laughs> Very good. All right. Um, Representative Bennett. All right, is this our last bill? Mm -hmm. Oh, right. My goodness. We're running ahead of schedule, which is so unusual for our committee. Representative Bennett. <laughs> Try to keep things moving here. Yes. Excellent. All right. Well. Good to have you here to present your bill, Representative Bennett. And uh, if you want to go ahead and move it, um, it'll be laid over. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House File 1680 to be laid over for a possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you very much. And uh, please go ahead and present your testimony, and then uh, your testifiers can offer their remarks whenever they're ready. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, for hearing this bill. It's, uh, it's one that's near and dear to my heart as a former teacher of 33 years. I taught mostly first grade. I know we have a lot of former teachers in this uh, committee as well. So I just want to start out by saying that we have a silent epidemic in our nation. Because every six minutes, a child is sexually assaulted in the United States. Now in our schools, we, we children learn about fire drills and fire safety. They learn bus safety. Um, we do tornado drills. We even now have intruder drills. But um, we, don't, we don't do anything to protect our children from sexual predators. And so um, before I start into the bill, I just want to give you a few statistics. And this comes from a national study done by the uh, Department of Human Health and Services that one in five girls and one in 20 boys is a victim of child sexual abuse. That's kind of a scary number. Children are most vulnerable to se child sexual abuse between the ages of 7 and 13. So this bill, um, House File 1680, would ensure that children are taught to protect themselves, that they're given um, instruction, and I'll go over a few parts of the bill, but instruction actually to give them a voice and to give them a voice to speak up about something that we know is a life altering experience for a child and moves well into adulthood, and that is uh, child sexual abuse. So in uh, House File 1680, there are no mandates for school districts. I'm very sensitive to that. I know our districts have many, many mandates, but I, there is an encouragement for districts to take up a curriculum that would um, teach children just simply once a year, one hour a year basically, either through an assembly or through classroom instruction, and teach children developmentally appropriate information about child sexual abuse, things like good touch, bad touch, good secrets, bad secrets, um, telling them that it's okay to say something. And I can't tell you how many women, have, as I've mentioned this to people as I um, go about my day, I've had women say, oh, I wish we, we would have had that when I was a child because I was abused by my neighboring farmer from age 9 to 13 and things like that. So, so many women have spoken up. This bill also encourages school districts to train their, their staff in um, things of rec recognizing child sexual abuse and, of course, mandatory reporting requirements. It also allows school districts and charter schools to accept funds from other sources for child sexual abuse pr prevention programs, grants, or whatever. And the federal government actually has just passed Aaron's Law, which is what this bill is called. Um, which allows for grants for funding for districts who would like to take up a curriculum or staff training. Um, 
this this bill would also have the Commissioner of Human Services um, make child sexual abuse prevention programs available on a on a website. Um, and that's something I'm actually working with DHS on. We had a little communication glitch and we're not able to get an amendment to tweak that part, but that's something that I'm hoping we can still work on. Um, and then in two years, it would require the Commission of Education to do a survey of schools just to see what are they doing in this area? What kinds of curriculum are they using? Are they finding funding somewhere? So that we can share that with other school districts and hopefully get this throughout our schools. So I'm gonna stop right there and um, have my testifiers just speak to me a couple minutes each and, and uh, okay, Madam Chair. All right, very good. Thank you so much. And uh, to each of the testifiers, if you would please just state your name at the start of your testimony. Welcome. Um, Madam Chair, my name is April Kane. Uh, I speak out on Aaron's Law because I am a survivor of sexual abuse and sexual assault. One of my earliest memories is being abused by my father in my parents' bed. Another very early memory is being abused by my father in a bathtub as he liked to take baths with me, a naked adult male with a small child. When I was 11 years old, I was sent to visit my father. He went away for work. I was there in the room with him and he asked me if I had started my menstrual period. As an adult, I understand this was because he wanted to find out if he had the ability to impregnate me. When I was 12 years old, I invited a friend over to my house. He hugged her in a sexual embrace and never let go. After I pried him off of her, I never invited a friend over to the house again. Uh, Aaron's Law, as Rep. Bennett said, is not a mandate. It's merely a suggestion that schools are allowed to teach children that sexual abuse is wrong. If you believe that parents are going to do this, it does not always happen. In my case, my parent was the abuser. And those children, if we don't teach them in the schools, uh, can suffer years of a horrendous life. I have had nightmares my entire life. My life was rocked by sexual abuse. And leaving it up to the parents doesn't work. Some parents also are just too uncomfortable to bring it up. I lived in an apartment building and I was allowed to go down into the basement as a small child. I should not have been allowed to go there. I was raped and sexually assaulted as a small child by a stranger in the basement. When I came upstairs, my mother could tell that I was upset, but I had no vocabulary to describe abuse. My mother simply said, you are no longer allowed in the basement. And it was never mentioned again until last week when I spoke in front of education policy. The person who raped and sexually assaulted me lived across the street from me, and he used to watch me out of his window when I went to get the bus to go to school. I understand as an adult, he is a sexual predator. But at the time, I did not know what he was, except he was someone who hurt children. In Minnesota, as Bennett said, we have a crisis that there are many predators on the streets as we have some of the weakest sentencing for sex predators in Minnesota. We have a crisis, and we need to give children a voice. This teaches them if you're wearing a bathing suit, that part of your body is private, and if someone is touching you, you can tell someone. If I had even had that training, that vocabulary, that I had a private area, I could have told my mother I might have received some help. So I ask you today to pass Aaron's Law, which is just a suggestion, is not a mandate, is a baby step. Because nine out of kids never tell, and nine out of 10 kids, it's someone they know and sometimes someone they love. Aaron's Law has been passed or introduced in 48 states, every single state, except Iowa, I'm sorry, Idaho, sorry to Iowa, and <laughs> <I> really apologize, <laughs> and Wyoming. And if we pass this, it allows the schools to accept federal money under Aaron's Law. Here in Minnesota, we had a bus aide who molested children. We had Mr. Babbitt, a teacher, who attacked 10 children. We had a principal picked up on child porn charges. In Minnesota, 88% of the people on child porn charges never see one single day in state prison. We have secret offenders, you may have heard on the TV about 200 of them who were not put on the sex offender registry. It is a tragedy because the registry came into existence because of the horrific death of Jacob Wetterling and was named after Drew Shadeen. And in Minnesota, we don't put them on the registry. They walk free, they're secret, they're invisible, and we have to protect our kids. Thank you for listening to my testimony and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Ms. Kane. We appreciate your testimony very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Sullivan. Uh, I am an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse and also the founder of Empower Survivors, which is a nonprofit uh, for adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. I never told my story. I had three violators as a child, and I never 
I never was empowered to speak. Um, and part of that is because I truly believe that it was my fault. I was told by my perpetrators that it was my fault that I made them do this. And in my head, I thought, if I made them do this, I'm a horrible person. It changed the core of who I was. Uh, made me think for most of my life that I was a horrible person, that I'd never amount to anything, that I was dirty, used up trash. And that's how I lived my life. And of course, I never told anybody until I was 42 and I opened up to my family. Uh, most of the time, survivors do not tell, and this is something that they carry in them. Um, when this happens to a child, it, it changes the core of who they are. They're forever altered, and most kids will never say anything. This goes on to them having issues um, that, that are looked on as behavioral. They'll get labeled as delinquents. They may get labeled with ADHD when actually they're being sexually abused. As April said, over 90% of, of kids are molested by people that they know, trust, and love. These pedophiles will, or predators and pedophiles, will groom the families and they'll groom the kids. They go after kids that are more shy, kids that a big target would be a single parent, their kids, uh, but kids that usually need to be just loved and seen and heard. I once heard somebody say they don't go after the quarterback, they go after the water boy. And, you know, every kid wants to be loved and wants to be seen and heard. And in some situations, we have, well, in a lot of situations, we have kids that are being seen and heard by people that are also raping them. And they're putting an impression on that child that is really a lifetime sentence. Majority of survivors don't even come forward till they're in their 40s, and by that time, they have, um, can be diagnosed with mental health issues, have physical issues, have issues with authority. Uh, it, the list goes on and on. Um, you know, a lot of times our kids are getting labeled with things. I think I already went on. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little nervous. Um, out of all the rapes that you see, over 70% happen to children. It's something that makes us really uncomfortable to talk about as a society, because nobody wants to talk about, I mean, talk, nobody wants to talk about kids getting raped or molested. But we need to get the conversations going because it really is an epidemic in our society and most people do not realize just how common it is. We have bully prevention, and we have all these other things that we'll teach our kids, but we need to equip them to be able to give voice if something is happening. We need to empower children, and we need to have people that are around children know the signs and symptoms of childhood sexual abuse, so if they're being sexually abused and raped, they can they can spot it if that child isn't saying anything. They can ask the questions to get the conversation going and get that child help. There's, I, I speak to thousands of survivors. I have offline and online groups. Majority have suffered long-term problems because of this. If they would have had training if they would have known that what they were experiencing at 4 or 10, 14, 
17, if they would have known that that wasn't okay and that it wasn't their fault, um, they would have been a lot better off. And I think as a society, we need to come together and protect our children. And this is one way we can do it. And I wish we could get more survivors that will come out and speak, but it is so hard because of the shame and the blame that most of these survivors will carry. I have people call me continually. I have grandmas that are 90 something, sorry. <laughs> I have grandmas that are 90 something years old that come to me and say this has gone on for four generations in my family and why isn't this being talked about? I have 50, 60, 70, 80 year old people that come to me and say, oh thanks. <laughs> that say to me that they wish they would have had the courage to say something. People ask me how I can do this work, how I can sit with so many survivors and hear one story after another. And I just, I have to say, once you truly, truly understand the gravity of this problem and how widespread it is. You can't help but do something. And I'm asking the state, asking all of you to please think about this. Look up the ACE study. It goes over what all this stuff that's contributed, gets, that happens when a child comes from trauma and it affects our entire community, not just that child. It goes into their DNA system. It goes on to the next generations. It goes into a community issue because we have people in our prison systems, a large portion that are sexually abused. We have people in AA, two thirds of alcoholics were sexually abused as children. We need to do something. They're filling our medical, I mean, they're, they have medical issues. They're, they're tapping into state resources. So we just, we need to do something. And I really hope that you all will help pass this through. Sorry for going long. That's all right. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan. And, and Ms. Kane, you've both been very courageous in sharing your stories. I know that could not have been easy for you, and we appreciate it very much. Representative Bennett. Madam Chair, I'd just like to clarify um, some data about Aaron's Law. Uh, that April maybe had mentioned, make sure it's clear in everybody's minds. Aaron's Law has now, is, is law in 28 states now, so it's passed in 28 states. Um, it is, has pending legislation in the rest of those states so that all but two states. So when she said 48 states, that means it's either passed into law or has pending legislation um, in the rest of those states. Clarify that, thank you. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Uh, do you have any, any additional testifiers? All right, not seeing anyone. Uh, any questions, Representative Moran. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a question, but first I'd just like to do the testifiers to say thank you for um, being here today to share your story. This is not easy to uh, share s such pain. And um, I too, like you, hope that we can do something. You, you mentioned words like trauma and ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences that really impact an individual for a lifetime. And so, and, and what you're asking of us is to just be a little bit more preventive right, that we can save one little girl or boy from going through what you had to go through. And so, so um, you know, um, thank um, to Representative Bennett for bringing this forward. 
Um, and, and I hope that we can do something about this because it really is about, you know, um, helping the child to be a whole child so that they can be successful in school and then thus in life. So, um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Dabney. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and <clears throat> as, as Representative Moran said, thank you to the testifiers uh, for the courage you're showing today. Um, I, my question is for the uh, author. How do we assure that districts, uh, if they choose to implement this, are using research-based information that's medically and scientifically valid? Um, Ms. Sullivan uh, noted that 90% of uh, sexual abuse uh, by children is family and friends. But it's often easier and, in fact, kind of safer to talk about the stranger danger piece which would misdirect the children if we're not, if the schools are not using the research uh, in their instruction. So how do we assure that the information we're giving the kids is the right information? I don't see the directive in the proposed legislation. Representative Bennett. Madam Chair, thank you. And Representative Dabney, thank you for that question. It's a good one. Again, this is all basically raise, raising or the awareness of this issue and suggesting to schools. One part of the bill does talk about um, that the Department of Health and Human Services would post uh, those research-based curriculums that are available on a particular website that's within there, um, already there. Um, Aaron's Law itself, that website lists about 10 different research-based curriculums. So it is out there for school districts. And you know, at this point, I really think we just want to give school districts the chance to do the right thing to access that curriculum. There are resources available for them to look into that curriculum pretty easily. But there's a number of different choices out there, and part of this would be to post that where districts, if they so choose, can access that information. Yeah. Um, oh, Ms. Kane. Uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to add to that that uh, the research uh, is available as 26 states have passed it and have age appropriate curriculum that is public and can be used. But to not do it is to throw away the lives of the children who are being sexually abused and that is not acceptable. That is not a choice that any human being has a right to do to a child. No school, no superintendent, no union, nobody has the right to say this child's life is worthless because that is what happened to me. And you don't want this to happen to anybody else. And these predators are career predators. They can abuse 50, 100, 200 children in their lifetime. And it goes on from generation to generation. And it creates a crisis. Mr. Babbitt in the South St. Paul School District had his own server, had double encrypted passwords, used drugs and alcohol, the news report, to attack the children until they kept it all secret, until one, the news reports had a breakdown. So to not do this is not acceptable. It is to it is cruel, fundamentally cruel and unacceptable. Uh, Representative Dabney, follow up? Mm. No, okay. thank you. Uh, Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Bennett. I'm really appreciative of this coming from the land of Jacob Wetterling. It's been something that's been really known in our area for a long time. And I think a lot of people think about um, Jacob, they think about the fact that he was a missing person. But we found out really recently, like last fall, of really the trail of abuse that happened to young boys in Painesville, Cold Spring, um, before, before Jacob. Mm -hmm. And um, if it were not for some of those young men, well, men coming forward, um, they probably wouldn't put, put the pieces together. But I think our biggest sorrow is in the fact that nobody had said it. Well, actually, they did when it happened. Some of them did talk to um, folks, but nobody really believed them, I think. Back in that time, it was just a lot harder to believe. But I think there's some really valuable lessons to be learned. And I'm appreciative of anything that brings it forward. Um, but we have to remember we have to protect our boys, too. We always think of girls. But boy, our little boys are getting hit, too. And, and that's a little bit different, a different mindset. And um, I actually had, um, there was a time I worried about our youngest. and. Um, Unfortunately, you know, fortunately, we, I think we stopped it before anything really happened. Um, but it's it's a heck of a situation to be in, and I think anything we bring to kids' attention, to know that they can say no, and that 
most of the time it is family members, but sometimes it isn't. And, um, you know, we just have a lot of work to do to protect our children. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, uh, Representative Benef, any final comments? Well, Madam Chair, committee members, thank you so much for hearing this bill. And I just like to close in saying, when you think of those statistics, one in five girls and one in 20 boys, bring that down to the classroom level. In my typical first grade classroom, that would have been five girls and one to two boys every year. That's a lot of kids. So I, I just think this is a necessary uh, step in raising the awareness for this amongst school districts. I think back to a student that I had years ago that was found out, she went through my first grade classroom in the third grade, we found out that she had been continually sexually abused for quite some time. She would have been being abused when she was in my classroom. And I just can't help but wonder if I would have had this curriculum, maybe she would have had the voice to speak up and, and uh, not have two more years of that torture. So thank you again for hearing this bill. All right, thank you, Representative Bennett. Thank you very much to our testifiers. Uh, very powerful presentation or presentation today. Uh, and Representative Bennett, you want to renew your motion to uh, lay House File 1680 over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, so moved. All right, thank you very much. And uh, with that, we have finished our agenda for today. Thank you very much, members. Committee is adjourned. <laughs>